Hi, and welcome to the Northern Myths Podcast. I'm Dan Larrabee. And I'm Luke DeWolf. We hear these stories growing up, and we watch these characters in our blockbuster movies. These myths have survived more or less intact for centuries, maybe even millennia. New peoples, new religions, two world wars, and massive tyranny couldn't erase these old stories. Why not? What was important enough for these ancient peoples to pass on in story from generation to generation? What truths did they hear in these stories that would help them survive and thrive in the world around them? Why do we still connect with these old stories? What can they tell us about our life today? The Northern Myths podcast is here to find out. We're setting out on a quest to learn the archetypal significance of these myths and legends of Northern Europe and what they can tell us today. How are you doing, Luke? Good, Dan. How are you? Pretty good. Fantastic. So today, we're starting our exploration of the poetic Edda, beginning with its first poem, the Voluspa. The poetic Edda was composed around the 10th century, around the advent of Christianity in Iceland. It's the largest collection of Old Norse mythology that we have available to us. We're using a translation by Jackson Crawford. which we find to be one of the most accessible and understandable translations so that hopefully everyone listening and watching can follow along with us fairly well. We're also supplementing uh, the Crawford translation with, with others that take a different approach or that sometimes maybe go for a little more of the literal meaning as opposed to uh, Crawford who definitely has put an emphasis on understanding the narrative. So for us, we use a little bit of both to get a good balance of not only the narrative, but the literal meaning of the original poetry. The Voluspa is the first poem of the Poetic Edda, and it's essentially a sacred text of the Old Norse religion. It goes into the mythology of the beginning of the world, the stories of the, the creation of the world and the advent of culture all the way to the end of the world, as well as introducing characters and stories that are expanded upon in other stories and poems. It's important to realize as well, though, that it's essentially assumed knowledge that anyone who was listening to this poem was growing up in the culture of Iceland. And everyone would have understood what these stories were, who these characters were. So a lot of the time there will be just references to characters and stories that we'll expand upon. And we'll obviously cover in different stories in the future here. Now there are two versions of the Voluspa, two major versions that we have available to us. One comes from a manuscript called the Codex Regius. That's where most of the Poetic Edda is actually from, is that particular manuscript. And it's the version that we're going to be covering here. There is another version from a manuscript called the Hauksbuch. And this particular manuscript is longer and includes a little more uh, detail in a few different sections. But most scholars agree that it was composed later and has a little bit more overt Christian influence. So... One day we'll uh, we'll cover the differences between those two versions, but today we're just focusing on the Codex Regius version. Sounds good. Shall we begin? I think so. Let's do it. A little bit on format here. What we're going to do is we're going to read from the poem here, and then we're just going to discuss. So hopefully that's clear to everyone here. Yeah. Uh, and to give you... Just a bit of context on the uh, the poem where we're beginning. Um, Odin has gone into the underworld and uh, raised up a seeress or witch, what have you, with a bit of uh, necromantic magic. And um, this is what she has to say about the world and 
any sort of the answers to his questions. So I'll start. Heed my words, all classes of men. You greater and lesser children of Heimdall. You summoned me, Odin, to tell what I recall of the oldest deeds of gods and men. Luke, what does that mean? <laughs> okay, so right off the bat here, this is setting the stage. It's demanding the attention of everyone who would listen. Gods and men, greater and lesser children of Heimdall. So that refers to that story, Children of Heimdall. That's in reference to another poem called The Lay of Rig, which introduces Heimdall as the father of the classes of humanity. And so that's an interesting reference here. Heimdall will come up again in the future. And this is really just saying that this is a story for everyone, in my interpretation anyway. This is something that is accessible for everyone, and it's, it's something that everyone should hear and listen to, pay attention to. For sure. Um, the uh, Something else is interesting is that it's... Again, going with the assumed knowledge, it's such a classic uh, part of the, the hero story where Odin has gone down to the underworld um, to get some hidden knowledge that he can then bring back and use for his people. And we're right smack dab in the middle of that. Um, and it's something that they would have known inherently uh, listening. And it's, it's important for us to note because we're not necessarily there. Like, we don't have that inherent knowledge, but they would have known, oh, yes, okay, this, this part of his journey. That's right. They probably wouldn't have had to have led up to that like we did. They wouldn't have had to have told everyone that that's what's what's going on here. And it's it's also important to note here who who is speaking. It's the, the seeress. You know, that that's clear by the line, you know, you summoned me, Odin, to tell what I recall. That's, you know, so that's that's setting up that it's the seeress talking for, for most of this. In, in fact, the, the entire poem is, is in the Sirius's voice. That's right. Correct. Yeah. That's right. So, and uh, this is really, I think, just setting the, the stage again, it, just out of, she's going to be telling the oldest deeds that she can recall. And so that's also kind of saying, I, I believe in, the, um, in another translation, it's, or more literally, it's, it's the, the furthest details that can recall. So, I mean, the, that subtlety there is, I, I think, a little bit important. It's the, the deepest knowledge that that uh, is, is there in the mythology, I think. And we'll see that in the, in the next verse. So, back to the poem. I remember the giants born so long ago. In those ancient days, they raised me. I remember nine worlds, nine giantesses, and the seed from which Idrisil sprang. Okay, so like we touched on, this is the earliest information here. This is actually before the foundation of the world. And, you know, the, there, there are a couple of things here about the relationship of the Cirrus to the giants that she speaks about. Giants are a shorthand in, or, or a placeholder, a symbol of that which lies outside the tribe, that which lies in the unknown. That's a, that's a concept archetypally that is hugely important to the narrative here and this is sort of to contrast what's inside the tribe and what's in explored territory that which you're comfortable with with what's outside so giants they even have their own realm of the world which we'll we'll get to but they are the symbol or the placeholder something like that of unexplored territory or unknown people that's right, and um, another way to look at it is agents of chaos, things that, that's the unknown, and she's remembering it being, uh, I remember the giants born so long ago, because at the beginning, it's, there, it, it's chaos still, and there are giants there because, I mean, really, the beginning is unexplored, like, we don't know what happens before the beginning, we don't even... Even today, with all of our knowledge, we don't know how things began. Um, Even if you go all the way to something like the Big Bang, right? the question is always, what caused the Big Bang? Or was there something there before it? That's that's something that this is essentially capturing. Right yeah, exactly. That, that not knowing. 
Another another note here that I I think is is possible something that uh, uh, could be referenced here the idea of the people that existed before creation before the world before humanity more specifically here we know that the Neanderthals were a group of humanoid people that lived in Europe with humanity and prior to humanity it, this could be some kind of allusion to that there were people that were different and that were already there in the past this is sort of pure speculation here but it's also a little bit of uh bringing in you know the the cultural background these are things that might have been told generation and generation and you know they wouldn't have called them neanderthals they would have called them people from outside the tribe or giants or something like that if they knew about it that's again a little bit of speculation but a detail that i thought uh, might have been appropriate here for sure um, something else worth noting is that um, we're in prehistory right now. We're, this is um, before civilization, before before memory. It's we're not. There aren't people yet that as we would recognize them. Yeah. All right. Uh, back to the poem. It was at the very beginning. It was Emer's time. There was no sand, no sea, no cooling waves. No earth, no sky, no grass. Just Ginungagap. So, Ginungagap. Another translation for that. This is the yawning void or the yawning chaos. And I think we both really like the translation yawning chaos because that's exactly what it, what it is. This is something that... Uh, in mythology and in the archetypes would be referred to as the pre-cosmogonic chaos, which is the chaos that exists before the creation of the world. And so the conception of that chaos here is encapsulated by the concept of Ginunga gap. And literally it, it actually relates to like the, the gap at the end. That's, that's absolutely the same thing as our word gap. It, it means for sure gap between things. So that's absolutely what's going on here. That translation is perfect. The, the pre-cosmogonic chaos, that's exactly what uh, should be here. And it's something that, it's chaos not even just in the sense of, you know, every, everything is, is uh, going this way and that, whatever. It's potential. It's the, yes. out of the pre-cosmogonic chaos comes everything. And going back to uh, relations to, like, say, the Big Bang or something like that, this could be, if we're, we're trying to pull it into modern science or something like that related to it, this is like that phase where all there is is stars getting formed and things like that. It, it, it alludes to that. So, For sure. Um, again, we see that the prehistory uh, theme uh, and uh, the mention of Emir. And uh, that's interesting because we don't get any details, which is, Another example, they would hear the name Emir and they would know what that means. But for us, um, Emir, the name's kind of a primal scream. And he is, or I say he, but Emir is androgynous. He both, he, even saying both male and female doesn't encompass that Emir is everything. And it doesn't go into detail in the Voluspa, but the myths have it that, uh, Emer's body is what makes uh, the world. Um, and I find it interesting that his, the name Emir means primal scream. It's Emer's the first creation. It's sort of that first something that out of nothing. And I think, and I'd have to read up on this or... Uh, look into it more, but when I when I realized that his name was Primal Scream, it made me think of uh, when babies are born, and when they their first action in the world is that primal scream of "I'm here," you, you know, doctors right. slapping babies to make them scream. Like it, it's sort of that. It really encapsulates that that beginning phase of something. This is the the first being in the world, which is 
this isn't actually the first being in the world. Uh, this is another bit that kind of gets glossed over. Ymir isn't the first being in the world, but Ymir is the one that ends up becoming the world. Uh, Ymir relates to similar, uh, what do you call it, uh, figures in, in other mythologies. Notable is in Mesopotamian mythology, Ymir has an analog in Tiamat, which is essentially the goddess of chaos in this particular case. And Tiamat had a, uh, a consort named Absu. And Absu was sort of her, her direct counterpart. And then they do the, the male and female uh, dichotomy there. Umir is interesting because Umir being genderless or what have you could be both in a, in a sense. And originally Tiamat and Absu were conjoined together like they were sort of one being absu ends up getting killed and forms sort of a uh part of the sea which is another symbol of of chaos the pre-cosmogonic chaos but tiamat abs ends up eventually being killed and she furnishes parts of the world so that's uh, a similar story uh but but also this is really just to connect that in these societies there are a lot of commonalities in their cosmogony, their creation of the world. So that's uh, that's just something that Ymir relates to in this particular case. Something that's important to for us to be able to understand the this particular stanza, uh, talking about the absence of natural features. There, there's no sand nor sea nor cool waves. That's that's something that uh, these natural features essentially don't exist. They're significant in their in their absence in, in this state where you have Umir and you have Ginunga Gap, pure chaos. Nothing has been ordered. That's what I get from kind of Definitely. that that section. The divisions of reality that are are so common, the sea, the sky, the earth, that even that has not been ordered up yet. So all we have is chaos and this symbol of chaos. So and and and, and actually that might be an illusion because um, an allusion to the fact that Umir will create all these things eventually. Yes. He he forms the sky, the sea, all that that gets formed by Umir. So saying it doesn't exist yet, that's I think a pretty good little shorthand, you know, reference to the more full story. For sure, definitely. All right, back to the poem. But Odin and his brothers created the earth. It was they who made Midgard. The sun shone from the south upon the stones of their hall, and the land turned green with growing plant life. So this one effectively continues the the story, the allusion to the creation of the world. The sons of Bur is the is the terminology here instead of Odin and his brothers, and that refers to Odin, Vili, and Ve, at least in uh, the the prose edda, which is the other major source of mythological knowledge here. So whether it's Odin and his brothers, the sons of Bor, these are the, the people who actually kill Umir and form the world out of his corpse. So this is kind of interesting here. I'm going to take a, a light tangent based on the sons of Bor. For sure. They are actually, this is actually saying that, that uh, Umir is directly related to Odin through Bor. Bor is the son of Buri, who emerged from Audumla, the primordial cow. And that is one of the most interesting bits of symbolism, I think, in this whole story. The cow being a symbol of fertility, of, of uh, domestication. There are countless examples of the cow. Uh, in, in Hindu mythology, for example, they're still revered for their life-giving milk and butter can't kill them and this is essentially what what they're saying here it's that is is the the method is mm -hmm. he's not eating Aldumla. he's he's suckling Aldumla. um the egyptians have a similar uh symbol as well which is a, a sort of a, a goddess that is related to the cow where their pharaoh when he would die he would go to be reborn with the sustenance of this sort of cow type goddess so that's that's a, that's a very high level i'm probably getting a bit of that wrong but uh 
uh, these are just some interesting parallels to Aldumla here, which really point to this being a symbol of uh, fertility of life-giving sustenance and whatnot that creates the world. And then Odin and Vili and Ve eventually come out of that and kill their, essentially their kinsmen because Umir was there in all of that in this lineage, not directly, but, and that mirror, that actually mirrors, um, the Mesopotamian story again with yes. Apsu. He gets Definitely. killed by his, uh, his grandchildren essentially are who kill him. And then, uh, Marduk is even further a descendant to who brings them back to order. So it's a big little thing here that uh, gets what one line, yeah, one line. <laughs> and it's something that again it would have been it would have been understood, but we have to really parse it out now for us to understand it. Back to the poem. The sun, companion of the moon, shone from the south, as the heavenly horses pulled it east to west. The sun did not yet know where it rested at evening. The stars did not yet know their places in the sky. The moon did not yet know what kind of power it had. Then all the gods went to their thrones, those holy, holy gods, and came to a decision. They named the night and the hours, the morning, the midday, the afternoon and evening, so they could tell time. So uh, for those of you who aren't actually following along here with your own version, which we encourage, <laughs> um, this was two stanzas here, so we didn't just go on one big long rambling uh, verse here, uh, but they're they're very much connected uh, in parallel here. And it actually echoes the, the previous stanza a little bit, the sun shone from the south, that was uh, in the previous stanza as well. Um, and that little bit of directionality, I think that's, uh, a detail here. There's a lot of directionality. Uh, scholars have understood the directionality, the important of the importance of the direction, south, east, west, etc. In uh, in a lot of other cultures, and I think that's something that I personally am wanting to know a little bit more about. What is what is the significance of south, east, west, and they they outline the the world in those terms. But uh, here. To my mind, this is almost a, uh, a, a description of, of what literally they would have seen. The sun would always have been coming from the south, so high up in the northern hemisphere, oh, definitely. essentially, yeah. right? And um, what in Crawford, the, uh, the way it describes what goes on here, um, the sun did not know, the, the, the sun shown from the south as the heavenly horses pulled it east to west. In uh, Larrington, translation by Caroline Larrington, and another good one that we'll reference uh, often, um, it says, threw her right hand round the sky's edge, the sun threw her right hand. So these are uh, just little details. The horses pulling from east to west are another bit of the mythology that's actually covered elsewhere. That's not in, in the literal translation so much. But that's a good detail that, that Crawford uh, added in there. I think he's doing something similar to what we are adding in little so bits too. and pieces yeah. where appropriate. But uh, yeah, the, uh, that directionality coming from the south, going from east to west, that would have been literally what they experienced, what we experience in, in the northern hemisphere. So that's just uh, something that, that points to their understanding of cosmology. Um, and then the the detail of these two stanzas is really... Uh, really important of there there being no con conception of time. That's right. Right. So, exactly. Yeah. There's no conception of time. There's no. Uh, they're coming into history and it's coming into civilization. They're coming into this uh, mode of being where they can everything kind of direction time. Like you, you know, you get up in the morning. Uh, for them, they would get up in the morning, they would tend their crops. Because, you know, if we've got uh, cows already in plant life, there is some uh, mention of agriculture. It's things that are dependent on time. And it shows a, a mastery of the world that we didn't have previously for for people. And that's a, a really important thing to note. It's, it's interesting you bring that up. Uh, agriculture. Fertility is one of the 
and, and agriculture are, are mm-hmm. one of the biggest sources of, of symbology, the, the cyclical cycle, uh, the cyclical conception of the world that we'll dig into and see here. Uh, it's theorized that that came from fertility cults that were based on time. You would have something die and go into the earth and then eventually spring up again anew. And there were, there were a lot of uh, cults dedicated. This is how the earth became assimilated to the concept of the mother, mother earth that came directly sure. from seeds go into the earth and then they come Sprout. out. The mother has done something there. And that's probably where burial underground initially came from. And it's even a conception of, you know, someone's going to maybe even come back afterwards if they've had their rebirth in the mother one day. So that's where reincarnation might've come from originally. That's where, Definitely, that's where this cyclical understanding of the world would have come from, and it, it, it all comes down to time. And so, this these two stanzas here are fantastic. They are for describing that. And that's something we should talk about too: is cyclical time versus linear time. Mm. Because right now we live in linear time, and that's how we understand the world. And that is not how they would have understood the world back then. Right, um, and it's. It might be easy to think, oh, well, okay, yeah, so it's cyclical time. You just think about it like that. But no, there are things about that that change the most basic ways that you look at at life. Uh, and you'll see it as we go through this poem in particular that um, everything sort of has a time and a place and a beginning and an ending. And But it, but it's it's never done. It's, it's not like a no. straight line. It's, it's, a, it's a circle. The, exactly. it's, it's going to restart whether it's generationally or whether it's, it's just events that are going to repeat themselves or something like that. It, the, the Hindus really, really, in, I should say in India, who, um, especially earlier on in the, in the, the Vedas, this is something that would have, okay, I'll go on a light tangent. For sure. Um, the Norse Germanics, they're Indo-European peoples emphasis on Indo and European, their language group originally split off into uh, two branches that one went towards India, one went towards Europe. So they have common origins. These peoples have common origins. And one of the best comparative uh, cultures that we can look at, because they started writing everything down thousands of years ago, but but still, they they started writing everything down. Is the is the Hindus, the Vedic uh, Hindu religion, and they have such a detailed description of of cycles. Um, we're currently, by their reckoning, in the in the end phase of the current cycle, like the the time of things kind of going downhill, which is a, a theme we'll we'll kind of come back to. But uh, yeah, it's, they they go so detailed, and and just being able to look at that and and say. Okay, here's a similar culture. It, it's it's not a leap to say that there might have been something just as detailed for uh, the Indo-European for for sorry the Germanic peoples, the Norse peoples, mm-hmm. a conception of of time and and cycles where there's for sure. different phases there. So definitely back to the poem. The gods had their meeting at Ithaval where they built temples and high shrines. They made workshops, they made treasures, they made tongs and other tools. So I like this one because it's describing humanity even further going into culture here through mastery of tools. And that, (laughs) again, I think the biggest takeaway for these early verses here for me is a description of what we know now through archaeology and history and whatnot, how humanity would have actually progressed. It would it was things like discovering time and, and ordering time and agriculture and whatnot. Then then tools come in and we start to Definitely. build things, building things, permanence, right? The this is a culture that's now starting to actually settle down. It's no longer purely nomadic, right? That's you know, buildings, temples. Some of them, there's archaeological evidence of of temples that were a little more temporary, like they would have been set up and used for a couple of months and then they move on to the next one sort of thing. But there's, 
you know, those are things that would have been revisited year after year after year once it became this is a permanent settlement or at least they're settling in the same area. They would they would have gone to the same holy places. For sure. Right? Uh, and it shows, too, that uh, especially with the, the temples and the shrines, they recognize themselves as as a unit, that there's a, a people there and that they're they're working together because uh, it's the the beginning of religion which uh translated from the word religion uh, trans, translated from latin basically means to bind together and so it wow it binds like we're seeing the the beginning like it's civilization because all people bound together with the same sort of ideas about how the world works and working towards this, this common goal of living and surviving and and thriving and so this that's, is yeah <laughs> i really like that it's a it's a great verse because it, it really it captures all of that that living together surviving together and, and thriving together because i mean tongs and tools like well and an interesting note here is that this is still the gods who are doing this but this is describing what humanity went through this is this, For sure. is, this is not something that was unique to the gods that sort of bestowed upon us here. I, I mean, that's what the story is saying and, and pointing to, but what they are describing is exactly what people For sure. did. And it, it shows, you know, it's not these gods with their magical powers doing this. It's, it's literally what people did to get to where we are now, you know? Yeah. That's, it's powerful. It's powerful to think about this stuff that way. Yeah. Back to the poem. They played in the grass. They were cheerful. They had no lack of gold. Till three giantesses came. Fiendish giantesses from Jotunheim. I'll keep going. That was the end of one verse. Um, Then all the gods went to their thrones. Those holy, holy gods and came to a decision. They would make the Lord of the Dwarves out of Emer's blood and his rotting limbs. Yeah, sorry, I, I forgot to jump in at the end of the no previous stanza there. Oh, well. Um, so this one, I'll, I'll, I'll point to a couple of differences here in, in the translation. Um, in Larrington, it's that they played checkers in the meadow. And I, I think I like the distinction here. They specifically made items for playing games like this is this stanza to me is describing the golden age the mythical golden age nearly every civilization actually describes some kind of golden age that we're wanting to return to that's almost the beginning of the concept of the sacred in general the world is is not this golden age anymore but you're you're trying to connect to the times that were sacred and that that goes into religious ritual which is really the reenactment of these sacred times yeah lots of good stuff there but you know they're they're playing games they're being married they don't want for gold at all it's a golden age it's literally a, a golden age <laughs> yeah like, <laughs> literally literally <laughs> um but that always comes to an end and the ogre girls or the giantesses or, or whatnot here that are, are coming up here, this is signaling the descent out of that. And it and it's it's exactly right that they're coming out of Jotunheim or Giant Land, which is the uh the home of we, we didn't cover that actually. There was a there was a, a reference to the, the nine worlds earlier. Uh we're not gonna go through all nine or anything like that, but they, they divide the world into nine and uh and here uh they're they're coming out of Jotunheim which is the the home of the giants or the home of the unknown the unexplored territory and it's perfect that they are coming out of the unknown it's contact with the unknown yes right so to to me that's the the key note of stanza 8 <laughs> that's right so it's contact with the unknown and it's um it's chaos coming into their idyllic golden age um 
and I guess we'll we'll see what what that chaos brings for them. Yeah, because absolutely. You you don't get to stay the same once chaos is introduced, and it also shows that no matter how great things are, there's always chaos there. Something is always going to come in, not necessarily ruin it, but just you can't make a chaos free or outsider free. Um, well, the living conditions. The story of the Garden of Eden in in uh, in the Christian or Jewish Bible. That's it's essentially the same thing. The snake in the garden. It's it's a garden, a perfect place, exactly. a golden age. But there's still a snake, something that can go wrong, something exactly. that, that can cause chaos. It, so that's uh, it's a it's a great little little verse there. I I made another note that this this could have been the initial contact with outsiders for humanity at the stage that they were. Maybe this was the first time they ever encountered a group that was not their tribe because, you know, humanity would have been so dispersed at this point, especially in Northern Europe coming out of the ice ages and whatnot. Maybe there was an extended period of time where they lived largely without contact with other tribes and they could grow and they had space to grow and no one was going to come challenge that. And so something like that is, is what I think reading this verse. I would agree. Do you want to reread nine? Yeah, I'll reread yeah. nine, yeah. <laughs> then all the gods went to their thrones, those holy, holy gods, and came to a decision. They would make the lord of the dwarves out of Emer's blood and his rotting limbs. This is another reference to Ymir, first of all. Um, I, I believe here they're actually um, in Larrington and, and in the, the original Old Norse. They don't actually go say Ymir. There's two alternate names for, for new Ymir that are used, but that lightly opens up the possibility that maybe they're talking about something else, but Bremir and, and Blaine uh, are the other names here, but for the most part, we understand that is referencing Ymir, therefore referencing back to the old story. And so the dwarves are getting created in the same way as the rest of the world here, essentially. And then we get into the dwarves, which is another one of our favorite symbols for just, <laughs> you know, how obvious the, the symbol of the dwarves actually is, right? <laughs> well, I think I'll continue and um, I'll go with We'll stop every now and then for, because it's literally going to be a list of names of dwarves for a bit. Um, uh, important to note that this was probably just shoehorned in, like they yes. mentioned dwarves, <laughs> and and so now the someone decided to say, okay, let's list a whole bunch of names yeah. of dwarves. <laughs> let's put in all the dwarves here. It's, that's agreed. Like scholars even think so. So anyway. Yeah, don't take our word for it. No <laughs> then they made Matsognir. He, he was the lord of all the dwarves. And next they made Durin. They made many man-like little creatures, dwarves of the earth, and Durin named them. And before I begin with all the names, uh, my pronunciation of the names probably won't be great, so please forgive me. Uh, Ni and Nithi, Northri and Suthri, Ostri and Vestri, Althioth, Dvalin, Bivor, Bavor, Bombur, Nori, An and Anar, I, Miothfinnur, Vague and Gandalf, Vindolf, Thrain, Thek and Thorin, Thror, Vit and Lit, Nar and Nirath, Regan and Rath, Rathsvith. Now I've named the dwarves correctly. Philly, Kili, Fundin, Nali, Hepti, Vili, Hanar, Sphere, Frar, Hornbori, Freg, and Loni, Aurvang, Yari, Oakenshield. Now the names of Dvalin's family, the dwarves descended from Lofar, as men tell, the ones who left their stone halls for a home on Yorval. These were Draupnir, and Dolgthrasir, Har, ha- Haugspori, Hilavang, Hel- Hel- Gloy, 
Skurfir, Verfir, Scafeth, I, Alf and Ingvi, Oakenshield, Fialar and Frosty, Fith and Ginnar, the names of these dwarves, the descendants of Lothar, will be famous as long as the world exists. So there's a few things I take out of this big chunk. Uh, first of all, early on, there is actually four dwarfs are named North, South, East, and West. I might have got the order wrong. I think it's, uh, yeah, North, South, East, and West. Uh, and New Moon and Dark of Moon as well. So those are really primordial things and connected to the elements of time, directions. Uh, so, so that's interesting as far as pointing to what the dwarfs actually are. I've, I've got some ideas about what the dwarfs are. I mean, we can we can probably cover that some point here. But what struck me about this whole big list is that it's really similar to the genealogies of the Bible, the gigantic chapters full of, of genealogies. That really struck me actually as being quite similar. Uh, it's a list of ancestors as well, if you, if you get that. Um, it's the... Uh, What's the saying? You know, they'll be they'll be remembered while the the world endures. The long list of ancestors. It's it's uh, it's interesting to me. I, I it seems like it could be something like those primordial humans, those mythological humans, because really in the, in the Bible, you know, Adam and Eve and and the whole bunch of the their descendants and whatnot, all the way up to Abraham, those are essentially mythological people. Essentially, they 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 consider them literally real in in that tradition. But to me, they, it's a, this is similarly mythological people, and, uh, and so I like that connection to the genealogies. Maybe these were the the people in uh, in Europe before the Indo Europeans arrived as well. That's uh, something that even archaeologically we're not completely sure of, but it, it's pretty clear that there was likely a group of people in Europe prior to the Indo-European peoples arriving. So that's that's just my thoughts based on that gigantic list of names. There's a lot of meanings and you know specific names there, and, and I'm sure we've lost some significance there, but uh, I, 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 I like to think we can get a little bit of, of meaning and understanding out of that big, chunky list there uh, part of it too um back then there it was kind of a an animist belief system so everything had a soul the rocks the grass so when when they're naming like north three and so three which were north and south um they they would have believed that there were there was a spirit to the north and spirit to the south and that uh the dwarves um and this will be covered in other episodes like elves things like that um, they had a spiritual component to them, and I, I'm sure some of this is naming those those spirits and and recognizing them. That, um, at least for them, it's uh, it's important that they they remember that. Um, and then the only thing I'll add too that's kind of fun, you probably re uh, recognize some Tolkien characters in here because he got a lot of uh, names from here, so like Gandalf and Thorin and Oakenshield. I mean. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's nice that he's he drew a lot of inspiration from this mythology. So it's you know we're we're in good in good company here. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the meaning of the dwarves itself. I mean, that's it's it, that's really hard to to nail down. It I, is, I, I think. But um, I do like the idea that they are created immediately following the descent into history that the arrival of those three giantesses has represented. That's one of the only hints I think that's actually in the poetry is, is immediately you have this golden age, then chaos arrives, other tribes, whatever, what have you. Then they create the dwarves. That's immediately the next thing. And it's also, uh, this is skipping ahead slightly, but it's before the creation of humanity, the nominal creation of humanity. So those are the only hints that I think that we actually get there. The Lord of the Dwarves is created first back in what stands at 10, something like that. Yeah, Mo yes. Motsugnir, um, speaking to there being a hierarchy as well. 
back in stanza number one talks about the classes of men this this is not a society that did not have a hierarchy this is not a completely egalitarian society there there were kings there were lords um that's just pointing to how ingrained the class system was you can look at the hindus again for this i mean they they're the example of a class system existing through time and this is this is also a an analog of that, I think. But uh, do, do you have any I- other ideas about the the role of the the dwarves here? No, that's. I think we've pretty much covered most of the things that uh, that I, I've thought about with the dwarves and having them shoehorned in here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. Uh, we do encounter them in other stories, so I think we'll dig into them a bit more when that uh, definitely when that happens. So. All right, so I'll continue. Uh, We're on verse 17 in in our translation. Three gods, powerful and passionate, left Asgard for Midgard. They found Ask and Embla, weak, fateless in that land. That's the end of that verse. Oh, but I'm going to keep going because it it makes more sense if we uh, continue on with it. So verse 18. They had no breath, no soul no hair, no voice. They looked inhuman. Odin gave them breath. Honer gave them souls. Loth gave them hair and human faces. So this describes the creation of humanity in relation to the gods we've already been talking about. And, and, and again, we, we did get into that what's described prior to this is what humanity would have actually done that's uh archaeological historical whatever that's that's true but this is still saying that there are these gods that came before humanity as we know it and created them essentially and what strikes me here so in in ask and embla are variously translated ask is is almost always translated as ash the tree ash Embla can be translated as elm or vine, but I like the translation elm just a bit better, just out of uh, it being kind of two trees. And that tree symbolism is actually one of the the biggest uh, things. We're, we're going to come to uh, Yggdrasil next, actually, just skipping ahead slightly, but uh, the world tree. But for humanity to have their symbol be trees here. That's something gigantic. Like way back in the beginning of time, we would have lived in trees. And so, if, so the world being a tree, that's 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 something. But for humanity to also be a tree, you know, maybe this is referencing where we came from or where we lived for such a long time. But uh, as well, it's, it's just... Uh, connecting to symbolism that is so long ago, so far removed from these peoples, especially who lived in Northern Europe. They're, they're not in Africa, in trees anymore. Very, very, very long removed. So, and, well, and then obviously goes into uh, the creation by Odin and his brothers or hypostases of Odin or, or something like that. Uh, Hunir is, is referenced uh, in one other place, but Lothar, I believe, is never... This is the only place Lothar is referenced, if That's right. I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, he doesn't get referenced again. Um, there's some thought that uh, Lothar might actually be Loki, but it, it's a theory. It's not. There's not a lot of evidence either way with, uh, with Lothar. Um, for this coming from Odin, though, to me, that that's the key detail of, of stanza 18, the second part here. For humanity to... And, well, and this is also, this is describing the creation of consciousness, essentially, yes. right? This is like humanity is discovering itself, literally, and that's what consciousness is. And all this other cultural stuff would have happened later, after the descent into consciousness because you know you're not you're not going to have chimpanzees 
building stuff or, or no. whatnot or, or giving, I mean, they haven't told us their names for the, the moon and the sun or anything like that, but we're just assuming they don't have them for sure. chimpanzees, but, uh, cause that's what we were, or we shared an ancestor with them for those of you who are being pedantic about it. But, uh, um, for Odin to be the one to create, and he doesn't create them at, in, a, in a physical sense, although I guess taking from Umir or whatever, he sort, sort of does. does. But in this stanza, he's giving breath, spirit, blood, complexion, the things that make humans, humans, blood and breath. Those are huge concepts mythologically. Blood was a symbol of life for an incredibly long time. The earliest religious records we have are, so, well, some of the earliest are uh, red ochre sprinkled on corpses as a symbol of that they actually have life and might become renewed. And and Odin is the god of inspiration and wisdom and giving breath and life. It just, it makes so much sense. We'll, we'll cover, we'll cover Odin a for lot. For sure. Um, that's why one of Odin's names is Allfather, because he's the father of all precisely for this reason in the stanza um something else worth noting and you touched on it is that odin is a god of wisdom and inspiration and without these things you wouldn't you need these things for human ingenuity so the building of tools and the the creation of the temples and religion and all that kind of stuff that would be directly attributed to Odin giving them breath. It's that that breath of ingenuity that makes humans humans, and 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 not chimpanzees. That because chimps do use tools, um, but there it's not. I mean, it's quite obviously not the same. And so we have a bit of an explanation for why it's not the same. We have you know this divine power infusing that in, into people. Well, and and just by the fact that they they make there's a distinction between the physical creation of the world and the physical creation of people. The, these things exist. This ash and elm exist prior to Odin. They they find them actually is the is the wording right? Yes. And and so they exist. They exist physically, but they don't have breath yet. And so I mean that that's such a key detail. And to understand that at this level of culture, I mean, there's no science saying no, that that one day we became conscious compared to our other ape ancestors, whatever. Uh, there's, there's nothing that they would have known particularly. So, I mean, it comes, it's coming down through stories. It's coming down through Odin. It's, it's, it's fantastic. I, I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say I'll, I'm consistently amazed and impressed by all these details here in these few, this first few stanzas that go into creation and whatnot, because it's, it's just mind boggling that they would have, such understanding of the world with, without going through it scientifically for sure it, it like it's it's sophisticated when it certainly doesn't have to be and, and no one would expect expect it to be at that level of i don't know what you call it human development but but it is there's a real understanding here and they're explaining it in the way that they're able to explain it and it's they're not dumb. They just don't. They don't live in the you know post enlightenment scientific world that we live in. But they understood what was going on. Uh, some, something that I find interesting. Um, so it says that they had no breath, no soul, no hair, no voice. And then later on, uh, Loth gave them hair and human faces. And I, it makes me really think of that becoming self, like self-conscious that or conscious of yourself that you know what you look like now and you know what you are and you can you have your own things to say because it you know no voice but now they have voice there it it really shows that they know who they are now that there's that understanding of the, them and their place in the world around them yeah i mean haven't we done there's been studies done that try and see, you know, is, is the dog who sees himself in the mirror actually recognizing it as in himself or whatnot. And, and gorillas and chimpanzees have shown a little bit of knowing that a little bit, but just an inkling, like a tiny bit. Yeah, I, I, really, I really like you pointing that out. That's, that's a great, uh, great detail that 
self-recognition. That's that's just as important as consciousness in general, I think. Right? For sure. I, I think it, in a lot of ways, it springs from that. Yeah. 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 All right, I'll go back to the poem. I know an ash tree named Idrisil, a high tree speckled with white clay. Dewdrops fall from it upon the valleys. It stands forever green above earth's well. Okay, Yggdrasil. This is the world tree, the center of the cosmology. This is one of the the most key concepts to understand here. And, and, and I mean, getting its own stanza here, I mean, you, you've already seen that so many things get just a tangential reference, right? For sure. And Yggdrasil was, was referenced earlier as well, the the seeds of the world tree or the, the measuring tree yes. beneath the earth, something like that. I think that was stanza four. Um it was referenced there, but but now obviously it's getting into here is this world tree. Uh, there's so much here. I think we're going to cover Urd's as well uh, in in more detail later. But just the very basics here. It's it's the well of fate. It's it's the conception of fate as coming through water. This is one of my favorite realizations coming from this is that it's describing it's a it's a well beneath the earth right the the tree is above this well and so what happens naturally uh trees draw in water from the earth and then uh it's sort of saying here that that uh it sprinkles that water through the the tree through the leaves um dews that are drenched with loam loam is uh is fertile fertile clayey soil right uh just uh being able to sort of say there um that it's it's drenched with these these fertile things that come from water in in particular um i don't know i this is so, to me saying that that fate flows through the world in in such a cyclical natural sense it's it's quite an amazing understanding there too definitely yeah um one just on a very practical level an amazing understanding of the water cycle that to me just blows my mind that they're able to figure that out i mean without again without science like it's just they they observed it and then were able to use it as symbolism for how they understood the world that's that's incredible um one of the interesting things for Idrisil for me is just the name itself. It, um, it translates uh, to Odin's steed, so his horse. Um, but if you look more closely at the word, you can break it up into Ig and Drasil. And Drasil is the steed part of the word. And Ig is a, is a word for Odin. And it actually translates as... Um, terrible terrible one and so i thought a long time about why would you call the world tree like the terrible one's horse um interesting tangent on that um odin is also the god of the gallows and so the, you know they would often uh talk about hanging from the terrible tree because they would hang outlaws and that kind of thing but i think there's Something a little more, I don't know what word to use, and I don't want to make it sound all dreary, but I think there's a recognition in, in here it, that life is tough because right, right in the word is terror. And you have, you, and I mean, life is tough and was tough for them. It, there was, you know, death was far more uh, prevalent in their life than it is in ours. And, you know, they, they didn't, they didn't feel any, uh, you know, less than we do. So when, when people that they love died, you know, they mourned for them as well. And I, I just, I think it, it recognizes the fact that that life is a struggle that you're, you're striving to survive, to, you know, to get food, to, to procreate, to pass on your genes. It's a, it's a struggle. And I don't want that to sound 
like I don't want to be a downer with that because I don't think they would have looked at it as a downer. Just that it's reality. It's reality, and that you know they were living far closer to that that edge of life and death than we than we do, and it just I think they were I think they were putting that like sort of baking that into the cake as it were, where it, like right in right in their understanding of the world was yeah it's tough, and. Uh, And fate will, you know, throw things at you that you weren't expecting. Yeah. Um, And and you see it in that cyclical nature where, you know, because of the water itself and the tree, so the water comes from Erd's well, fate. It's going up the tree and then falling back down. It's, It's a life cycle of an individual, of a village, of a civilization. It's all... And it passes through the tree back into the well. I mean, back that's... into the well, and and you need, and it, and then it fertilizes the tree again. Like you, you need, and you need that cycle. It can't, you can't just keep going forward. You need to. Rem- to me, it's showing that you need to remember, or at least respect the past enough to know where where things have come from. Grow out of that. Sprinkle down your own knowledge to fertilize that again, and then you go again. But it's it's an amazing symbol. It, it, it absolutely is, and and I mean, it, it's hard to overstate how brilliant this this symbol really is. Uh, just in in the fact that it's it's a microcosm of the world, and that's the symbol of the world. I, I mean, just on the face of it, it's it's uh, no, it, it, it's it's incredibly powerful, and and there's just so much there's so much here. That that was a fantastic point. I'd never thought of it like that actually, especially with. Uh, the translation of, of Ug, the the terrible one. They could have picked dozens of other names. Oh, and dozens. And I'm and I'm sure in in some ways it it relates to you know the the poetry and and whatnot. But no single detail here is random. In in these oral traditions in these societies, I mean, they certainly they're putting together beautiful poetry that that follows some rhythms and meters and things like that. But no detail in here is put in out of place. And and that's when we're going through the poetic at a, the sagas, anything really, we're going with that assumption that every for single, sure. every single word was put there for a reason and not just because it made the poetry work. So no, that's, that's a fantastic point. I'd never, I'd never thought of it like that. And uh, it obviously references uh, another story of, of Odin that will, we'll get to but it, it's also the the importance of of the connection to the yeah that that struggle that's that's fantastic that's a great point i i had not thought of it like that and then then and then the connection to fate and the just all these these natural metaphors here it's it's uh it's really really quite amazing definitely the only thing i think that it's probably worth mentioning as well, but probably won't get into it too much. Is the uh, the symbol of the tree uh, in shamanism as well as um, Odin is a, actually only one of the archetypal uh, shaman figures in Norse mythology. Uh, Freya would actually be another one. Um, and there's this idea, and it's an idea that's shared throughout the world of. Um, in this mythology, it's going up the tree, but sometimes it's seen as going up a ladder. Um, but it's sort of the idea of traveling between between worlds as, as shamans, uh, you know, as they do. Um, so that there's an idea of going to the, the underworld, the middle world, Midgard, and then up the tree to the upper world. And yeah, so that that's playing in here. Well, I don't I don't uh, know enough about all of that to speak a lot to it but just that 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 stuff is going on here as well oh yeah and 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 odin being the archetypal shaman for the norse i mean that that's that's perfect as well and and then the name makes even even more oh more definitely sense and it, it's it's they might have had other names for the world tree and it would be this would be an example of a kenning uh a, a shorthand poetic form that uh is used to refer to something give it a name whatnot but this is really the main name that is used everywhere for the Definitely. world tree. Like that's the proper name of the 
Old Norse world tree is Yggdrasil. And just for that to have been the one that's stuck and the one that's used here, and it's, it's used pretty well everywhere. Um, that connection is, is fantastic. And maybe a quick word on those those kennings. The, those aren't random either. Like they, they're going to be a one or two word little phrase that uh, encompasses some aspect of the person that they're they're talking about uh, I'm trying to think of some we'll we'll, we'll point to some examples uh, I don't want to be pulling anything out of my out of my butt just now but uh, in in this case it's uh, it's really telling that this is the the most important attribute of the world tree to be connected to is that it's the steed of the terrible one it's that's a really interesting mm-hmm idea there it's, and it's one that i mean you can think about for hours and hours and days and still find more stuff about it. it's one, yeah it's a good one and we barely even touched on uh Ur's well thankfully the next stanza i think does a little does a little more with it um but i will just mention here that Ur's well is located in asgard it's closest to the gods asgard being the home of the gods in relation in comparison to midgard being the home of humanity and Jotunheim being home of the the giants unexplored territory so Asgard is almost like the 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 place of these ideal beings these beings that uh, took place in this uh, primordial time this golden age and whatnot and Urzwell comes out in Asgard if you, if you were drawing a picture of it 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 doesn't make as much sense as the, the way they talk about it but the the well comes out in Asgard and the gods are sort of the the closest to fate. That's the closest thing that I can really get to there is that they have attached themselves to fate in a in a key way, but even by making their home where fate comes out, being connected to it there. That reminds me of um Jung talking about the archetypes and saying that we all live out archetypes and hopefully you figure out which archetype you're living out and as you're saying that that that's what came to mind because if the archetype you're living out is almost your fate because it's going to determine what happens in your life in in a, in a broader sense and the gods having these archetypal qualities well of course they would live next to like next door to fate so Anyway. Great point. Great point. Well, with that, I'll go on to the uh, the next verse. Three wise women live there, by that well, under that tree. Erd is named one. Another is for Thandi, or I guess for Dandy. The, th- the third is named Skuld. They carve men's fates. They determine destiny's laws. They choose the lifespan of every human child and how each life will end. I'll make a quick note here. There is a diversion in numbering in some versions of the Voluspa. Some translations split what we just, what Dan just read into two verses, two stanzas, 20 and 21, but Crawford and others uh, call it one, just 20. So from here on out, if we're referencing numbers, we're going to be referencing Crawford's numbering, but it could just be off by one. So that's just uh, something if you're following along and you have a different translation from what we're using. So, but this stanza talks about the Norns, the, the, uh, what do you call it? The anthropomorphization of fate, right? That's, that's definitely, that's correct. So lots here. That's why I kind of wanted to wait on this stanza for some yes. of the discussion of, of Urd, and, and there, there's even another one coming up, which I don't think we'll get to today, that goes even into more detail. But uh, yeah, they, they're the description of the, the fates. It's uh, This is actually a possible Greek influence uh, by the year 1000 and up to 1300, whatnot, um, when this was getting written down. They they would have act, they would have known about the Greeks the classical uh, civilizations the Romans and whatnot they would have known about that this is possibly an influence here and uh, some scholars do speculate that they might not have necessarily been people or women originally but still 
why not? Why not? Because they do it for everything. They do it for everything, even even in the list of dwarves and, and the sun and the moon. I mean, they're, they're given personifications. For sure. Right? So, so why not? So that's just, it's good to make a note of it, that this could be some influence from outside kind of creeping in. But I, I, I don't see a good reason to for that to change the meaning of their role and what they represent. So, no, definitely. I think it's uh, if it is an addition, it's it's fine. It doesn't uh, it doesn't mess mess with it too much. Their names here, so Urth, which is also uh, in in Anglo Saxon weird and that gets brought up in uh, in even um a good example is macbeth they have the weird sisters yes that's literally this and our word weird our word weird ha, it comes from w-y-r-d the anglo-saxon word weird and then the old norse form is urth and that translates to fate and then verdandi verdandi or or, or whatnot is happening or what is happening uh what has happened it, it's 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 a strange little inflection it, it could mean sort of the present tense but it could also mean sort of the past tense it's almost that which has been laid down as of now right now right now and schooled is shall that's it's actually literally shall the uh the future tense, essentially. That's uh, that's my uh, understanding of that. And so it, it lightly corresponds to past, present, and future. Not really, not exactly, because their conceptions of past, present, and future were not the same. <laughs> but if, yeah, it, it's it's essentially that. So their their names are very much these key elements of not even time as in like a, a day night cycle but time as in a, a cycle centered on the present that is everything is constantly being laid down as to what happened and then there's constantly the future ahead so that's that's the real broad basics of uh, their understanding of fate and time but it's it's a huge concept right oh it's enormous you could you could do a whole you know, three hour lecture on that. Um, things that are probably worth noting um, is that we're not, it's not so much being introduced, but uh, time is again pl coming into play. And it's this idea that uh, the people aren't fully free. They're not, uh, they have a certain amount of free will, but they also have, these fates and destinies, they even say determine destinies, laws. Like we are subject to certain laws. I mean, even now we're subject to certain laws like gravity and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the, I think that's part of the point is that who makes, who makes these laws? Why does the sun make things bright and darkness make things dark? All these things come from the Norns and this otherworldly power that you know, and and we're their not necessarily their playthings, but we are subject to them. We're not we're not in charge here. We're we're doing the best we can while these other entities or powers act upon us. Yeah, I, I think that's a a key difference here, possibly from the like the the Greek is is similar, but it's it's also very structured in that they're they're actually you know causing the fate of, of people like they're actively determining it yes. almost like these could be the, the most important gods or figures in the entire mythology. Oh, for sure. If they are literally causing the destiny of everyone and they are somehow these puppet masters that are literally doing everything because I mean, if you take it to its natural conclusion, if, if we are 100% deterministic as in there are forces that are causing us to do all the things that we do, the Norns, become these all powerful yes things but that's not what they are they no. i really like your your point there that they're almost related to something like gravity it, that's like if they are the description of the natural forces that limit us and the description of th this is this is a 
covered elsewhere. The concept to them is called Urlog, literally the original law that was set down, and that's essentially the, the limiting factor for each person, right? So if it's describing things like that, describing the natural forces that exist and that affect all of us, and then as well describing the fact that we're limited by our circumstances, that is brilliant. That's that's why sure. this conception of, of time and fate to me is is really, really uh um really mind blowing that they would that they would get there and, and talk about it like this. Again, it's it's another one of those things that's just so sophisticated. It really is and it's there's so much in it. Um yeah, no it's a it's a neat, neat idea. Uh, and to see it in other other cultures as well, it's neat that it if they did get it from the Greeks, which there's no reason to think that they didn't, um, it resonated enough that they decided we need to put this in to our stories because it ex it helps explain the world around us. Like it, that's why comparative religion is so interesting. Uh, Mircea Eliade, uh, a great historian of religion, has um, has this this book called The History of Religious Ideas, and he'll bounce between. He was using a, an example of uh, uh, the the menhirs and dolmens, the 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 great stone megaliths in Europe, but he used an example of Indonesian mythology as as something that was a different idea from so far flung out in the world that was actually almost exactly the same. It was it was something like uh, the this creator god offered humanity this stone. And they didn't like the stone, and so they they gave it away. And then he offered them a banana, and you know who doesn't like a banana? So, For sure. so they took the banana, and then the god said, "Okay, well you screwed up. Now that you've taken the banana, your lives are going to be like the banana. You're going to rot and decay and die. But if you had picked the stone, it would have been permanent." Wow. And then what it translates to for these men here is these uh, uh, great like Stonehenge. That's a uh, not a dolm dolmen. I'm mixing up the term. Maybe that's a dolmen. Um, the these great stone structures. The idea there is that they're creating something permanent that is going to last in time. And it was almost uh, uh, one theory is that it's it's where the souls would actually go after death, and they would live on in these stones. And it it's just this comparative religion and mythology and whatnot. This is Indonesia. We have almost no relation to, at least linguistically, genetically, a very long time ago to the people of Indonesia. But yet they have stories that resonate and, and make sense. Like that story it almost explains sure. their motiv motivations exactly. Definitely. Right? So it's it's uh, that's why comparative religion can help fill in the blanks and can help. You, you know, you don't take it 100% literally like this is probably exactly what they believed. But it's an example there that just helps. For sure. And I'm just saying with the stones, like, I mean, we have headstones now and even, um, the people that we're covering now, the, the old Norse and Germanics, they had rune stones to commemorate people and events and that kind of thing. So the, the permanence of stone is a, I guess a worldwide acknowledgement. Like that, that's a, again, sophisticated. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that sort of, ties into fate i mean it's almost defeating fate to have something that that's actually permanent and lasts that amount of time and and these these stone um cultures the cultures that built these stones this is like 5000 6000 years ago in some cases by estimation right but then you get into around the year 700 800 in scandinavia and they're putting up rune stones right so this is a, a connection to some of the original european peoples that we know well, we certainly we only have archaeolo archaeological evidence of them, right? So, I mean, it's it's just so mind boggling to think that these ideas just they last, they last, they last, and that's that's almost the the key thing that we're exploring here is that these are ideas and stories by living on through stories. These are ideas that have probably been in humanity for thousands of years since Definitely. since we developed consciousness for how to create and order the world. I guess we're, we're not really doing anything new here. 
<laughs> no, no, we're not doing anything new, and but we're we're learning from the the past, the the stories of our of our fathers, and resurrecting that for modern audiences, hopefully. So fingers crossed. <laughs> All right, back to the poem. And uh, in this, I'm going to do uh, two verses. So in our version, verse 21 and 22. I remember the first murder ever in the world when Gulveig was pierced by spears and burned in Ho Odin's hall. They burned her three times. She was reborn three times, often killed not a few times. Still, she would live again. They named her Haith. When she came into their homes, a sorceress who foresaw good things, she knew magic, she knew witchcraft, she practiced witch witchcraft. She was a pride of an evil family. It's a good, good couple of stanzas here. Definitely a departure from what they were just talking about. And this is a, if you haven't noticed already, a key feature of this poem is that it, it jumps around. It's just giving little introductions of stories and concepts and stuff, but uh, Gulveig, oh, and a another thing to mention as well, other translations have that uh, they'll actually say, i got it here, she remembers. Um, That's right. Right, so she, she remembers the first war in the world instead of I remember the first murder or, or, or whatnot. Um, just for your own understanding, uh, Dr. Crawford made the decision to standardize all that to I, the Cirrus is speaking in, in, in these cases. And so in other translations, you might see she, it's always the Cirrus speaking in this particular video. He, he mentions that in one of his, his videos, check out his YouTube channel. We'll, we'll put a, a link underneath some good stuff there. Um, so Gulveig, it's a little bit unsure who Gulveig actually is, but a lot of people think it could be Freya. Yes. So Freya is actually from the Vanir, which is a different tribe of gods originally anyway. They eventually sort of become as one or referred to as one, but she is from the Vanir. And she is, uh, the Vanir are, are sort of more naturalistic. They could be representing an older religion that eventually got absorbed by the Indo-European religion. It's possible. We can't really know that. So it's it's there. There's a lot of um, possibilities with the difference between the Aesir and the Vanir, but it's really just uh, all we can kind of say is that Freya comes from this other tribe, this other tribe compared to the Aesir originally. So Gulveig uh, is possibly Freya, and in uh, in Larrington, this stanza starts out with it actually referencing the first war in the world. It's possible that this is saying that Freya is actually a hostage in the with the ace here mm -hmm. this could be what it's referring to but other, otherwise it, the the detail just kind of isn't there right and if we go with the idea that uh Gulveig or Freya is a hostage uh the idea is that you would trade hostages as as a part of the truce uh because then you're not only do you have people of, of worth in the other person's camp uh, they'd also there'd be interbreeding, and then you would uh, you're not you're probably or less likely to go to war with family. Um, interestingly, uh, Gulveig uh, translates as golden, and when they talk about uh, burning three times, there is some thought that it might be might be in reference to. Um, refining gold and burning away impurities and there's also this idea um, very similar to this that to make a, a seer or a, as a you know a witch as uh, Crawford translates it um, there are trials and you have to you have to refine I guess sort of a natural aptitude for it to get to this golden uh, standard it's a it's the concept of initiation absolutely yeah. and Initiations are handled differently in every culture, but they are prev they are present in every culture essentially. And it's it's interesting here to me. In a lot of our own examples and understandings of initiation, a lot of them are explicitly for males, 
And the reason for that is actually because, or at least hypothesized, is that women are initiated by nature naturally. It, like that's that's just something they go through to to enter puberty and whatnot. There's there's a physical change, whereas for men, boys, it's it's completely different. And there's there's this ordeal and there's this transformation. And so for for it to actually be here and it to be female, I, I think is is very uh, it's a it's it's almost a, appropriate that they're they're talking about an initiation for women who go to do chaotic things because this isn't this isn't just going to be for every woman this this particular initiation isn't going to apply to every woman it's going to apply to wicked women it's going to apply to witches seers whatnot and this starts to get into no it doesn't this absolutely i think references some traditional feminine archetypes feminine masculine there's a, a distinction between the archetype of the masculine. That doesn't mean male. This, that's mm -hmm. that's something huge to to understand is that archetypes and the feminine and the masculine do not mean male and female expressly. Men can exhibit the feminine and women can exhibit the masculine sure. in their lives and their stories and whatnot. So that's that's just um, something to bear in mind. We're we're not going for uh, this this whole. Uh, saying that women are all like this, men are all like this. It's definitely, yeah. But, uh, this is the, the division archetypally is that the masculine is representative of order and explored territory that that's hugely oversimplifying it. <laughs> but the feminine is, is, uh, chaos and unexplored territory. And this is really the initiation into that side of the feminine. There's sort of a, a positive side of, of femininity, which, uh, creation essentially all absolutely comes from that but then there's also this kind of destructive chaos and 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 so for that to this is also referencing necessarily that this is something taboo in society wicked women are the the people kind of em embracing this chaotic nature but at the same time it's it's something that's almost described the way it's referenced here is almost necessary like why would you describe this kind of initiation transformation and whatnot in, into something that, uh, you know, they're not saying that this is something don't do. This is just something dangerous. You, you have to sacrifice. You have to give something up to get this magic, to get this whatever, this conception of, For sure. of all that. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really interesting here, the symbolism. Definitely. Um, and, and just to be clear, I want, uh, when we were talking about like the, I guess the dark side of the feminine, there's a dark side of the masculine as well. I don't, I don't want, we're not, we're definitely not like saying women are bad or anything like that. There's with the archetypes, there's sort of a positive expression and a negative expression of all of them. Um, for example, with, with men, they become, it's more of a tyranny, uh, and everything is ordered in its place and not so much and basically driving out every last remnant of chaos actually which the is, word for that these days is patriarchy yes so there you go um something interesting is that you see this type of initiation specifically like it's a very violent initiation with burning and killing and, and that type of thing it wasn't um exclusive to the the norse and germanic peoples uh, the Iroquois had something called a mourning war when so when people would in their tribe would die and they they wanted to replace them, they would go and raid a neighboring tribe, kidnap people, and then do similar types of initiation. So, uh, you know, burning and other forms, I guess, basically physical torture uh, until they kind of convinced this person to adopt the identity of their of their dead relative or friend so it's actually a very common a common thing across uh cultures which i, I found uh, very interesting when i read this is that i had I'd read something like this before so that's, that's great it may, again bring like the iroquois there there's uh, a 
connection somewhere, but but like that's 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 from the opposite side of the world, right? And, and oh, it's, definitely. And it's just great. That's great to notice that this is something from so far removed, and then there's there's such uh, similarities. Now, another note uh, on here: if this is Freya, it's it's actually, and this is in other stories, right, uh, where they explain it. Odin learns his magic from Freya, and archetypally that's almost saying that you know as a as a man odin is a man he has to learn these mysteries from a woman who's already discovered them and that's almost well okay to to me what that says is not something like okay this is this is something that's only for men only for women whatever but this is this is more saying something that these are that there are mysteries and there are there are certain things that that uh, each, uh, the, the masculine and the feminine are, are each going to kind of do naturally. Yes. Right? And then if you are someone from, you know, a man looking to do feminine things or a, a woman tr- looking to do masculine things, you have to go searching that out. And it's going to be like, who, who are you going to go to for that? You're going to be, you're going to go to a master of these feminine or masculine things. And it's it, it's just a an interesting note about you know odin is able to do these things these things that are you know feminine traditionally feminine whatever but the master is the person he's learning from the the master absolutely is a woman so that's it's just a, a an interesting commentary that they would have had that structure for sure and i'm sure there's deep understanding that we're not getting to because we're not I don't know if it's lost to time or whatever but there there is some there's something to it that like it's a really important thing that like they've got two verses about how he, how you turn a, a woman into into a seeress like that's a big deal and uh I I I don't think we can sort of emphasize that enough that that understanding and that Seeing that, I guess, a, a type of power that I don't think we see today, or at least we don't recognize that we see. So that it's interesting. Yeah, I, I like I like that you you mentioned that this is this is important. Like going through this transformation and going through to gain these skills, that's important. Like this is not to trivial. This is not to say that this stuff is negative and this is this is bad. Odin is talking to a seeress. That's the entirety of this poem. Yes. Right? This is really absolutely nailing down the point that to get to that place to access these mysteries is is an ordeal and but what you get is something great. This is <clears throat> probably the first place that we're getting to that's actually emphasizing the concept of sacrificing for the future like going through an ordeal a sacrifice in order to gain some wisdom they would have used the term wisdom pretty extensively here to describe this stuff wisdom was a much more broad term to the uh, the old norse there it, it didn't just refer to factual knowledge but it referred to common sense it referred to uh, uh understanding of the world and it referred to these uh, these actual mythical uh, uh you, you know um uh, foresight and and looking at the past uh seeing things um so it's probably the, the first mention i mean there'll be a, there'll be other significant uh stories of sacrifice and and whatnot here but this is this is the first one considering we're we're looking at uh at voluspa and so i mean it's it's an introduction to a big concept that was was important incredibly important to their culture and to their understanding Something else I think that's worth mentioning, and I, I'm not sure about this, and I, something I'd want to talk about. At, at the very end of the of verse 22, she was the pride of an evil family. That to me, that to me sort of raises the flag of a, a bit of Christian influence, um, because they wouldn't, in other places, they don't look at um, women who practice magic as evil. There, there isn't that that sort of moral judgment on them. It's um, maybe chaotic, yes, but chaotic doesn't necessarily mean evil or bad. It's just 
like raw potential. And so when, when I see the, the word evil here in the translation, it makes me think that uh, Snorri, who is very Christian, uh, would have looked at it as... Yeah, Snorri Sturluson, uh, he didn't necessarily write these poems or even compile them for the first time, but he definitely he wrote the, the prose edda, and he, he does a bit of a hack job in, in a lot of cases. Uh, you, you do kind of have to pull out the 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 meaning behind it in a lot of cases and that's why we're we're not we're covering the poetic at a first because it's it's much more uh free of those sorts mm -hmm. of of influences and and i mean going back to we, we we talked about this like i mean we are going off the face value of the poetry but we're also not going in blind if there is a an element like this here and, and i like that you pointed that out where there might have been some influence from christianity it's it's important to at least put that in the back of your mind. Definitely. They're still saying some reference to an evil, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But if that came from something that's outside of it, then yeah, take it with a grain of salt at the very, very least. Now, the, the specific types of magic that they actually mentioned, say their um, spirit magic is another kind of translation here. That is specifically found in sami religion the yes the, the religion of the uh the finnic peoples that live in the the far far north of scandinavia and uh and finland and whatnot and that's another light bit of maybe i won't say evidence but just a pointer to maybe the Vanya were originally some of these people that were there before the Indo-Europeans and that were different from the Europeans. And maybe they had practices that were just slightly different and that are today manifested by these other cultures. There, There is a theory that the original culture of at least Northern and Central Europe before the Indo-Europeans came in was the Finns. Uh, that's a, a mostly discredited theory by a, a Finnish, uh, I think he's an ethnologist. I would have to look that up. Uh, mostly discredited just due to lack of, of evidence more than anything. But little things like this where you just draw up that connection. Okay, here's this society today that has a mythology that does these things that are similar to this other group of people, the Vanyar, not the Aesir. It's just a little thing that points to some uh, some different ideas here. So I, I don't want to read into that too much. I don't want to make connections that aren't there. But I'm saying that th this is something that uh, does exist in the world. So For sure. And it's reflected here. So that's pretty cool, I think. Yeah, definitely. I think with that, we can... Uh... I think we've we've done what we can here. <laughs> I think this might have been this these two stanzas might have been our biggest single discussion and that and that's surprising to me. I didn't, Definitely. <laughs> I didn't think we would spend so much time on this one, but darn there was some good detail there. All right, back to the poem. Verse twenty three, if you're keeping track. Then all the gods went to their thrones, those holy, holy gods, and came to a decision about whether they should endure Gulveg's depredations or whether they should seek revenge. Uh, so this is one where I would actually like to give the full translation from Larrington for this stanza. Then all the powers went to the thrones of fate, the sacrosanct gods, and considered this. That was just the refrain that's been over and over, and I've got some thoughts on that as well. Uh, whether the Aesir should yield the tribute or whether all the gods should share sacrificial feasts. So can you read again the, the last two of the stanza there? Uh, for sure. Actually, it's all sort of one sentence. So I'll just read it again. Sure. Uh, then all the gods went to their thrones, those holy, holy gods, and came to a decision about whether they should endure Gulveg's depredations or whether they should seek revenge. Yeah. So, okay. So I think this one is where there's a little divergence here. Um, so in, in, in Crawford, this is obviously referring to whether they should uh, take revenge on the from the actions of Gulveg or Freya or, or or whatnot, but in, in here it goes into more of a an idea that um, the Acer should yield tribute to the Vanir, and that's actually referring to tribute from humanity, uh, sharing in the sacrificial feasts. It's almost an idea about 
implying anyway, whether the Aesir should tolerate that the Vanir would also be given sacrifices by humanity, tolerating that this other group of gods would get equal recognition. So what that points to, for me, is that almost two groups of competing gods, pantheons, whatever, whether it's even two groups in the same tribe or the contact of different tribes that are coming together, uh, hard to say. But uh, definitely, uh, if you're going with uh, the reading similar to Larrington, which is in this case, uh, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but it's closer to the literal than than what Crawford uh, has in his translation there. Um, no, that reading, it, it's... it's uh, it's vague, but it's it's there that it, the coming together of cultures or the coming together of, of pantheons, whether they should agree to live together or whether they should go to war. <laughs> so that's that's my thoughts on 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 this one. It's it's interesting. I agree, and uh, I, I think you you pretty much covered that. That, um, yeah, just that. They're kind of they're sort of deciding whether or not they're going to be at peace or they're going to go to war. I, th- I think where where these translations differ is the, is the reasons uh, for that, right? Like that's that's the only thing where they differ. It, the yeah, I would agree. The result is the same, but the the reasons for that war. I, I, and I like both. I like the understanding that and and the implication as well of why the Vanir deserve tribute is because they're able to perform these, these acts of magic and things like that. So it's more like, Hey, we can do all this stuff too. We should be worthy of, for sure of, uh, of this tribute as well. That's, that's sort of the nuance. And I think both translations get there. Right. I would agree. Yes. And I do want to mention, um, the, the refrain that we've been getting to the, the thrones of fate, the holy, holy gods. Um, yes. This is what the third, fourth time this has come up. I think now. so. So I just like that it's emphasizing that uh, that these gods are going to a place of fate to decide things. The thing, uh, even in the modern day, is the the parliament of many uh, uh, many Scandinavian cultures. The the great thing is the. Uh, the big thing is the name of the literal name of the Norwegian parliament. I think the Danish as well. And uh, this is where they decided things essentially democratically. For sure. And yeah. uh, even though in, in a lot of cases, like there might've been a king who had the final say or something like that, it had to come down to the democratically uh, chosen decision of the the people there. And so, I mean, this is almost a, a description of that concept even so early on. That's pretty neat. Yeah, that there's Yeah, it's a, sort of a form of I guess democracy that you would you would recognize as a precursor to what we have now. Like it's not yeah. it's not that uh sort of alien to to what we have right now. Well, and it, I mean it's important to understand that uh in the western world common law being the uh um the underlying legal framework for many many countries uh not the US, but uh many, many other countries, uh, that came directly from this same cultural uh, pool, right? Because it, it came from Anglo-Saxon common law, which is, you know, the society most adjacent to the Old Norse, uh, at least in at this time of of culture. And the fact that they say thrones of fate as well, it's like they're coming to this place of fate where destiny is decided and what is said here is important and and it's going to be the decision is going to have effect and that that's what that says to me all in two words absolutely back to the poem odin let a spear fly and shot it into the fray that was the first war ever in the world the outer wall of asgard was broken the vanir knew war magic they trampled the valleys that's an epic. Uh, that's an epic verse. <laughs> it totally is. It's a, uh, you, you know, you, you hear all these other stories and and whatnot. I mean, of the Lord of the Rings, whatever, where they they go into such huge description of battles and stuff. That's the closest thing we got here. <laughs> First war in the world, and I mean, it's four lines, but it's still pretty darn 
descriptive, right? Definitely. Odin hurling the spear is a is a a common symbol, and, and again, it comes to Odin is like the central highest god who has his hands everywhere, right? Him hurling the spear is what signifies war, and that and that was a common metaphor was that you, you know someone would throw a spear over the battlefield and and then you're good to go like this the war is happening right that was the symbology that came through in directly in, in other cultures right so for sure and in fact um a lot of times they would throw the spear as a way of sort of marking it like marking the the victors for odin or the and the sacrifice for odin because it was viewed, the war and battles were viewed as a sacrifice to Odin. And Odin would choose the victors, not necessarily you. He would often, uh, he was a fickle one. But uh, the idea, the idea though, was there that the dead were a sacrifice to Odin. And that, and we'll get into this in other podcasts, but Odin had a second choice of the dead to bring into uh, Valhalla. Uh, Freya having first choice, which is very interesting, and sure yeah, we'll talk about later on. First thought of that though being some kind of compromise, like the two powers together. They've got their two most sure. powerful uh, deities here that are uh, the ones who get to decide, and the Vonnegut get to go first. That's that's it's interesting. We'll we'll touch on it. It more, is obviously, so. Um. I also like the part about the outer wall of Asgard being broken. Uh, part of that means that the protection security of their tribe and their inner world is now breached and that the, the Vanir who are not their inner tribe can get in. It's uh, there, it, it, We talked before about, you know, there's always a snake in the garden that you can't keep chaos out. Well, now with the wall in the uh, or with the hole in the wall you now have like not just like a snake slithering in but now the ability for an army to come in which okay, chaos has breached the order that you have created absolutely it's, it's a great symbol it's a great symbol and the the idea of war magic trampling valleys like if it can trample a valley it can trample your wall like it, that's Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it, it's enough to have domain over nature, and nature is almost so much more powerful than whatever little things that we're able to kind of order up oh, in the world. Oh, absolutely. Almost, right? So that's uh, that's a good point. If you ever want to see something interesting, there, there's a documentary about uh, what life would be like if humans just disappeared, and seeing how nature just retakes everything, like within a year, kind of thing. Like it doesn't take long at all, and you can see as well the the trauma of this that what happens when you know chaos comes in and, and it's not it's not just a snake which you know in the sort of judeo christian uh mythology that causes enough trouble and trauma, but you now have a wall down and it's they're marching through it like this is it, it's a big deal. This is this is a big deal for the Aesir and the Vanir. I mean that it would it will ultimately change both of their cultures completely. Certainly, it, well, yeah, war concept of conquerors and and the conquered and yeah, that that's one of the the largest ways for cultures to change and and I mean every city had a wall in medieval times anyway because Definitely. without that wall, your enemies can just kind of get in there and, and and humanity as a collective has put up walls around layers of things i mean you, you have your house but even which is your set of walls for your stuff but even within your house you set up rooms for specific little bits of stuff to go into those rooms and then outside of your wall you maybe have your neighborhood which is for just certain little bits of people that are kind of like you and then it, it just goes on and on and on and i mean it's this is just the reference to walls here. This is this is something that has that society, humanity has decided is a pretty good thing that walls are a thing that exists and 
boundaries between chaos and order and the inside and the outside or something that is natural and, and should exist. I think that's, that's a, a conclusion here and breaking that down is, is, is a catastrophe. It is a catastrophe. And it's interesting. It was mentioned earlier that uh, the Vanier are more, more nature based. And you alluded to it as um, the wall being creation. It's, it's sort of that, that's why we have walls in our houses is to keep sort of the chaos of nature from killing us because nature is always trying to kill us. Even, and it, it's funny to think because especially in our day and age, we don't get that many opportunities for nature to kill us, but it's, but it's always there trying to kill us. Like it's, <laughs> we haven't, uh, we aren't that safe. Yeah. And, and I mean, this is, this is sort of uh, other readings of this have, painted this war this primordial war whatever as as being exactly that the conflict of of nature and culture and and that uh nature is going to be against culture and, and so i mean you you can read into that literally but it's also almost a case of like one culture gets is a little more into cities and stuff like that and another is a little more into rural life or whatever and the, the conflict that's going to be there like look at politics these days i mean that's uh, in a lot of ways it's a oh, conflict sure. between urban life and, and city life sorry, urban life and rural life and it's uh it's just that it plays out so uh literally like this that they're they're literally at war and it, it, this isn't to say necessarily that the vanir are 100 percent just a symbol of nature period they're likely the symbol of of a culture that is just more nature based, probably a fertility cult, like a um, based on agriculture and 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 whatnot. That like they're the gods of the Vanir, the Freyr, Freya. The Freyr is is definitely the masculine side of, of fertility and agriculture. Absolutely, and it's, it, it's so it, it's the the conflict of of societies at different stages almost is is what this also is. No, but I, no, go ahead. Oh, I just, it's fascinating. Absolutely. It's societies at different stages or, or that have gone in different directions and they started rubbing up against each other. That's sort of how it, that's usually how it goes really is that. I wonder if we should go on because it, some of the stuff we've talked about, well, unless you have something to add, just. Well, yeah, no, no. That, yeah. Uh, we, we might as well uh, finish off the, the bit about the, the rest of the war, right? Right. I was going to say, yeah, because it, uh. It goes into it nicely. So I'm going to be reading three verses, uh, 25 through 27. Then all the gods went to their thrones, those holy, holy gods, and came to a decision. All the air would be poisoned with their deceit, or Odin's wife would have to be married to a giant. Thor alone was in the mood to fight. He does not take it lightly when he hears of such things, broken promises broken oaths and vows, such false speech as even the gods had uttered. So, literally, narratively, uh, this is describing the peace treaty between the Vanir and the Aesir. Uh, it's probably skipped through a fair chunk of events, but the implication of the most previous verse is that the Vanir actually beat the ace here, something like that, but they're but they're willing to go for enough of a truce, so it couldn't have been that one sided. So um even just from a practical aspect, but uh they made a peace treaty and bonds were broken. They they did not uh fulfill their peace treaty accurately. They, whoever, some side of it, um in a, in earlier sources, the Gesta Denorum, I think, is one of them, and the Inglegas Sangha is, uh, is another that that go through. Yeah, I might be confusing bits of those two. Go through th this, the the peace treaty of the Aesir and the Vanir, in, in much more detail, and and they're older and they're they're different, and uh, and so this is this is a concept that was was well throughout the the Germanic world world space. So definitely. Um... I'll add to the, they mentioned a few ways of breaking your word, which was a huge thing for them. And it's still a huge thing for us, 
breaking promises or vows, uh, that kind of betrayal is, it goes against, it, it goes against not only the person that you're betraying, but in a bigger way, sort of the society, because if the society can't trust what the individuals are saying to each other, everything breaks down because a society or a tribe or a civilization is built on people essentially playing the same game. They're playing by the same rules. So that's why, you know, when you, you know, walk out of your house, someone is, is not likely going to come up and kill you. And, you know, if they do or try and kill you there, you can go and call the police. There's all these things that there are rules in place and then things to make sure the rules stay in place. Then you have, you know, broken vows here and that, which really ticks off Thor, who, even though Odin is the all father, Thor was often seen as sort of the primary, primary God of worship. Like if you're going go to temples, Thor's, uh, what do they call a God pillar? Yeah. Yeah. It would be in, in the center. And he is known as a, you know, the fr a friend of humans and uh, he protected them from giants. So chaos as well as uh, there's, he also uh, worked with fertility. Uh, he blessed things like he really, at some points in their history, he was kind of a, a catch all for goodness and, and good and prosperity. And so for Thor to be, uh, in the mood to fight because he's hearing about, you know, broken promises and vows that he, even the gods have uttered, like things are breaking down and he's not having it. And it's, it's important because in a, in a society, when things are breaking down, when, when lies are being told and the, the rules that keep everyone together are being broken, it's important to have those figures speak up and fight against that to maintain order. And that's, that's really what it is. He's, he's trying to maintain the order that, uh, that has been established because you're right that the war was over and the peace treaty was, was made and this is going to break things apart again. So I hadn't thought of it like that at all. That's, that's really, really good. Uh, yeah, the, I think you got it exactly right. He's the, the, the defender of order. This is our first introduction to Thor as well, by sure. the way, um, in, in this poem anyway. Um, and yeah, he's, he's, he's angry at, at oath breaking. He's, uh, primarily, no, fundamentally he's, he's for fairness and honesty. And then that's, that's, uh, the distinction between Thor and Odin in a lot of cases is going to come down to, you know, Odin's, uh, ability his uh, willingness to go into things that are a little more deceitful less honest sure. things like that uh, versus Thor who's almost kind of the every man sort of thing in a lot of ways who's just out there to defend uh, defend order and whatnot and, and him being the one that gets angry here but, but I, th I think you you made a very good point I hadn't even thought of it like he's just the defender of order period that's that's a really good uh, uh, way of looking at it for why Thor is the one there i'm just going to two um building on that and i just thought of this uh thor's weapon is a hammer which isn't necessarily what you think first when you think hammer you think of building and creation and building order out of sort of again out of and against chaos and so he really is um about ordering things and making sure that uh chaos can't destroy thing like destroy what's been made so it's a really good introduction to thor and uh a few other uh little details here i say little they're not little um a couple of bits are that uh odin's wife or god's girl in, in other translations have to marry a giant or be given to the giant race that's a interesting detail i think there's other places where we'll get to know a bit more about that but uh bottom line here is that there's no resolution that's actually explicitly understood here and i think that's important enough maybe there's something missing here 
maybe. Uh, there's a few places in the, the poem where it's speculated that a few things were being left out when this was written down, but but here there's no resolution. There's no resolution to the fact that oaths were broken and there was no peace. And what that says to me is there's no resolution when you're dishonest, when you when you break your word. There's nothing is gonna put the genie back in that bottle. Like it's 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 done. It's done. And and uh sort of just throwing it out there is that and and that it happened but no resolution happening i think that's that's right that's saying that there is there is no coming back from oaths being broken it's it's not going to be the same that's for sure absolutely yeah that that's uh that's a very uh good point to make that with the, the seriousness of oath breaking and they took it very seriously back then we probably don't take it as serious now we probably should but yeah once it's broken it doesn't it doesn't come back not and not the same way so how you how you get from here this war this peace treaty and everything to you know groups of people that are actually okay with each other you know that's sort of implied or understood that eventually they they got it together and they were fine but here in this poetry they they it's implying that it maybe wasn't fine or but at the very least it was hard to become fine because of this oath breaking so i think we uh we can take some some uh some understanding from that some lesson from that out, out of just this is this is something that doesn't that doesn't uh, just go away so that's uh i don't know the, these are these are good little little bits of not o not only just some fun some narrative of uh you know this war and this peace treaty, treaty and everything but it's it's a big deal. Big concept. Definitely. And I think this is where we're we're going to, to stop. It's a fairly natural place to stop. Definitely. Yeah. For the this episode. Ending of the war, the Vanier is sort of a a sensible place to stop. And then we can start up with uh, whatever comes next, next time. Next episode will be big. This uh, It's just going to get more fun. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, did we want to just make some, uh, some slightly more formal acknowledgements to a few things? Oh, definitely. Um, so first of all, again, we, we showed you, uh, Jackson Crawford's Poetic Edda. So we're going to, uh, uh, put a, a link to his Amazon and to his, his YouTube channel, uh, into this video. And, uh, for those of you just listening, uh, search Jackson Crawford. Uh, great, uh, great guy. His YouTube channel has some some really interesting oh, introductions sure. to uh, to Old Norse in particular, like the the language and whatnot, but also some really good uh, background in Norse mythology. So, it's it's really great. It, it, it's well worth your time checking uh, his channel out definitely. and picking up his book. It's a it's a great translation. I've I enjoy it quite a bit. Absolutely. And then uh, the second person that it would be a miss to to not mention. Uh, his influence on our work would be Dr. Jordan Peterson, University of Toronto professor of psychology, did a lot of work over the last, uh, what, 20, 30 years on narrative and its relation to archetypes. Uh, so, so drawing from work of uh, Carl Jung, and uh, uh, he's just uh, incredibly influential on our, on our work. And uh, the format of this, uh, of this series, this, uh, this podcast is based on his biblical lecture Definitely. series. So if you want Shamelessly ripped off, really. <laughs> we watched that and thought, geez, you know what? The, the Norse stuff should uh, get that treatment. Exactly. And so uh, if you're interested at all in, in this sort of thing, he's got some great lectures on his YouTube channel. We'll post a link to his YouTube channel as well as his website where he's got a, uh, a list of books you can read, which are, uh, you know, we're, we're slowly working through a lot of, a lot of those books. Uh, definitely great if you want more information on some of the archetypal side of it uh, and and that sort of work but also his his uh, lecture series as well are, are fantastic he's got two courses with uh, actually multiple years uh, a course on personality and transformations and a course on uh, his based on his book maps of meaning which is where we get a whole ton of uh, the the information and details here and then finally his biblical series which is just a fantastic uh, watch or listen if you're if you enjoyed this at all Absolutely. Uh, with that, if you uh, liked what you saw here, please subscribe and like the video. Share. 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 Facebook, Twitter, Instagram.
We're, we're, we're a little bit new to some of the social media stuff, not active posters or anything, but we will include our social media information uh, for Northern Mist, the Northern Mist podcast, if you want to reach out. We encourage your comments. Let us know what you liked, what you didn't like, where you think we're wrong. If we're wrong, we'd like to know about it and we'll correct it. For I'm sure, because sure we we're not, we're definitely not like preaching here or anything. We're, we're, we're thinking we have the final say. We're learning as we go, so... We love having other viewpoints and uh, facts brought to our attention. Like, it'd be great. So, Absolutely. thank you so much. And I'm Dan. Thank you for listening. I'm Luke. Again, thank you for listening. And hopefully we'll uh, see you next time. This has been the Northern Myths Podcast.